Praise God. <clears throat> Math, re scripture reading today is Matthew 7, 16 to 21. <clears throat> By their fruits you will recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then by their fruits you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So be it. morning. Good to see everybody's beautiful faces, including my wife's. And if you noticed, did that to me when I come down because I made her laugh while we were singing. I looked up on the stage. It's not that I don't love to hear her beautiful voice because I do, but I looked up and I said, who's that redhead up there with the short hair? <laughs> if you didn't notice, she did her hair this week and it looks, lo and it looks lovely. <laughs> and I love her and we'll talk more about love in a minute. But I got a love tap when, when I, she came back down. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you that um, you are a God that blesses us and loves us so much. Lord, that we can have joy and peace that comes from Jesus, that we can have in the midst of any circumstance, that we can know what love is because you chose to first love us. We just thank you and praise you, adore you, Father, because of your adoration for us. What more could Jesus give than to give his life for us? Lord, help us to be recognized by the fruits that we have, the love that we have for one another. Help us to shine our lights. Help us to love as Jesus loves so that they will recognize that we belong to you and that we bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the last couple of weeks, I've talked about the great commandment, the great commission. Does it apply to you or not? And it does, and how it applies to you. And last week we even talked about a new fishing philosophy where we learned to fish for men rather than to worry about the things that we did before, the life that we had before, the things that were important before. And I mentioned to you that the first command that Jesus gave was from Matthew 4.19 to come and follow after him and he would make you fishers of men. It's not something that you do on your own. It's not something you can even do on your own, but it's something that God working through you that you must do. You must become like Christ. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and then love others so that you live a life that puts them first, that you think of them over yourself, and you think about their future for all of eternity, and you do your best to train them up to be a witness to be an example. So Jesus' last command before he left this earth was you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. If you are born again Christian, you are born again by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God lives in you and should be living through you. And if that is the case, you will be his witness. Jesus will make you into a fisher of men. But I also mention a little P.S., and I told you that if you would read Revelations chapter 2 and 3 and then some more chapters in John, you would get some insight on what I'm going to preach about today. P.S., do you know what that means? It means postscript. It means it's an afterthought. But have you ever thought about P.S., I love you? Is that really an afterthought? You see, that's the most common P.S. you ever see. But that's not an afterthought. I'm just reminding you of how much I love you. So it's really not an afterthought. It's really what thought, the thought process that started the whole letter, the whole relationship, is that I chose to love you. Then I can look up and smile and make her giggle, and she can look down and smile and make me giggle. Because there are those looks of love that we still have, and there are those other looks too, and you don't want to see one of those looks. And I get them probably more often than I get the loving looks. But the love is still there, and the love is a choice. The love is so wonderful. It's not because of what she does for me. It's because I choose to love her. 
and she chooses to love me because love is patient and kind. Love keeps no records of wrongs and everything else because that's exactly how God's love is for you. That he would love you so much that he would send his only son to die so that you could spend eternity with him. And he gives you life now so that you can have peace and joy and abundant life here on earth, living as a child of the kingdom of heaven, but now here on earth, so that others can see your good works, that they will glorify God in heaven and draw men to him. So Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 wrote these P.S. letters to seven literal churches, five of which didn't get too good of a uh, letter written to them. But there was still the love there that Jesus had. He said, despite how you're doing, I love you, and all you need to do is turn to me. But two of the churches got a pretty good letter also, and we're going to kind of briefly look at each one of them. But when we get to that seventh letter, I don't think it's ironic or uh, just happenstance that they're written, written in the order that they're written. We get to the lukewarm church. Who wants a love that's lukewarm, where you don't really care one way or the other? That's not love. It's not even a relationship, let alone a loving relationship. If you love Jesus, even a fraction, an infinitesimal amount compared to what Jesus loves you, then your love will show. You can't be lukewarm about what God did for you. And if you are that way, and that's your testimony to others, how are you ever going to draw and fish for men? If you're lukewarm, Jesus said, he's going to spit you out of his mouth. What a terrible thought. First command, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Dute opiso mu, which means come. When you come, you leave everything else behind, all of the things that you lived for before, your love affairs, everything else, and you come to follow a new one. It takes a changing of your mind thought about what was important, what was the purpose of your life, everything else, to what it is going to be now. And the fact that Jesus loved me so much that he died for me. So how can I not be compelled to live and die for him? It's to come after him and follow behind him in the pattern that he set. So I leave the world behind, fix my eyes on Jesus, and follow after him, trying my best but failing miserably, but by the power of the Spirit, doing incredible things that you never thought or imagined you could do before. Just think about all of the Old Testament stories and the New Testament stories. Look at the disciples, how they, how they lived, who they were before they came to the power of the Holy Spirit, and how they lived their lives afterwards. And they were compelled by love, and their love was shown to others, and the church grew. Matthew 4.19 says, Come, follow after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, don't miss that point. says, At once they left their nets and followed him. They left their jobs. They left their families. They left their securities. They left their whatever behind to follow Jesus wherever he went. John 10, 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Matthew 4, 20 and John 10, 27 have the word akalutheu, which means to follow without regard to anything else, the one that you're following. Jesus even says, You're not fit for the kingdom of heaven if you longingly look back at what you had before. It's a choice that you have to make if you're going to become Jesus' disciple, his pupil, his student, so that you can make disciples thereof. You've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. You've got to not be distracted. You've got to let the Holy Spirit empower you to do this. So what have you chosen to do? Have you chosen to be a disciple fishing for men or not? You cannot train up other disciples if you're not serious about it yourself. And you've got to be compelled by the love of God. All this, the hymns that we sang and courses we sang this morning, they talked about how much love Jesus has for us because God the Father loves us so much. And God dwells in us, His Spirit, that He would love us that much to come dwell in us. This would be His temple, this body. 
so that we could bring glory and honor to others by the way that we live. This week I want to look more at that P.S. that I said, the P.S. that I love you. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, Jesus says, Do not be afraid. That's how he starts off these letters. Because I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one that will bring you into eternal life if you fix your eyes on Him and follow after Him. Or He's the one that holds the keys to death and Hades as well. He came once to offer us life. He came lovingly and He will return lovingly. But He also returned with judgment. How will you stand on that day? So Jesus writes these letters to the churches and says, let me give you a little checkup report. And P.S., let me tell you how much I love you. I don't care the things that you're continuing to do wrong. What I care about is that you love me and I will transform you. I will make you fishers of men. Sure, you're going to fall down and you're going to fall into sin and transgressions. Don't think that you're not. Because if you're not right there, you're proud and you just fail. If you fall into sin and temptations, then get back up, not by your own power and your own might, but because you take Jesus' hand that He's reaching down to you and pulls you back up so that you can live a life that you could never live before He empowered you to do so. Fear is what keeps us from love. Have you seen that pattern throughout the Scriptures? If we fear men rather than God then we turn to the, the master and ruler of this world. If we fear what we're going to eat or how we're going to be clothed, then we don't put our trust in God to provide those things for us. It's clear throughout Scripture, and it's there in the Scripture that Merle read this morning on the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus gives us these new ways to live that we could never, ever live, that are crazy. How can I love my enemy that way? But we can if we simply let God empower us that we don't fear men, we don't fear things, but instead we put all of our trust in God. And then that perfect love will cast out all fears so that we can love one another even to the point of sacrificial death to save them. So why would you fear? And as you quit fearing, if you learn to give up that fear, you'll learn to love more and more and more. So here's the first letter to the churches. You'll find it in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. That's a good commendation. That sounds like a great church, doesn't it? They know doctrine. They walk well, everything else. Verse 4, though. Yet or but I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Now, this is the first letter. I gave you a spoiler alert. It said The last letter said that you're lukewarm. This letter says, you love me, you're a church, I gave up my life for you, you said I believe and follow, and it's genuine, but you don't have the love that you did have. Anybody that's married here, look at your wife or your husband and say, if I love you that way, is that okay? That I don't love you as much as I first did? Let, let, let's let, let the guys ask the women. You'll get slapped too, guys. That's not okay. You should love more and more and more. And even more because of the things that you have made it through together. Because you know that that love is real. That it doesn't keep records of those wrongs. That it loves unconditionally. That it's not proud and puffed up. But it seeks others over themselves. Just letting you know, guys. You can help me out too because it works both ways. It's not okay to love less. You want to love more and more and more. 
because you trust more and more and more. And that fear is not there because perfect love casts out all fears. So Jesus starts out his letter to the first church and says, you don't love me like you used to. I love you enough to give up heaven. That was God's will. That is my will. I come to dwell in you in the, with the Holy Spirit. You don't love me as much as you did, though. Verse 5, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. That's all you've got to do. You've got to reach back up, let Jesus pull you out, say, thank you, I love you, and continue on. Don't pour poor pitiful yourself. Don't say you can't do it, anything else. If you are a child of God, then nothing can separate you from God's love. Neither heights nor depths nor principalities or power, nothing can separate you from God's love. Live like you realize that. If you do not repent, though, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place. Now, there's some questions about what that means, what the angel of the church is and everything. But if we go back into the first chapter, you'll see that the angel is a messenger. It could be the pastor. It might not be. We're not going to get caught up on that. But Jesus also says what the lampstands are. That is the churches. So Jesus doesn't say here that he's going to come and remove you, he says he's going to come and remove all of us. You take that and put, put it however you want to think about it. But we are one body. Just as in marriage we become one flesh. I have an obligation to you also to uphold you. That is why we're supposed to confess our sins so that sin doesn't get in the body and cause problems. We need to think of others over our own needs to keep this body strong to keep it focused on its mission, to be a light corporately to this world. Because that's going to show people even more. How can all of these people that are so different get along because they're grounded in love for one another because they're grounded in love that God showed them? So what do you think about your loving relationship with Jesus? Is He your first love? If He's not then what are, take time to do an inventory, what are the things that are competing for His love? It could be something simply as, like I said, I'm afraid to, to do this calling that, that Jesus has put upon my heart because I don't know what I'll do for a job then. But Jesus told us clearly not to worry about the clothes you wear or the food that you eat. If you look back at Jesus' temptations, the Spirit immediately took Him into the wilderness after He was baptized and He faced those same temptations. He knows the temptations that you face. They're not unfamiliar to Him. He became flesh and blood and faced all the temptations that you face, but was, is without sin. And He can guide you all the way through to eternal life because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He dwells inside of you. Now, even if there's not other romances in your life, and then we need to talk if you say there's not, because <laughs> there probably are, but is your relationship with Jesus exciting, romantic? Husbands, look at your wives again and ask them and say, Honey, is my relationship with you romantic enough? No. There you go. <laughs> you guys don't have to ask. You just follow after mine. <laughs> no. So there's some room for improvement there. Jesus wants to be your first love. He must be your first love. He gave up everything for you. Doesn't that tell you how much He loves you? Uh, Revelation 1.17 started this way. Do not be afraid. I read it a minute ago. Why? Because Jesus is the first and the last. The living one. I was dead. Death can't hold me down. I am not now. Look, I am alive forever and ever. And where I have gone, that's why we read John 14 a couple weeks ago, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. So I am coming back to get you. Don't worry. But you do have a commission, a mission. You are an ambassador now here on earth to draw others to catch fish, but men fish. Okay? Not just put the little symbol on the back of your minivan. 
Verse 19, write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. What you have seen, what is now, which is right here going on in the church. We could take these letters and apply them right to our own church. And then what will take place later. You don't need to figure out everything in Revelation. You just need to know that things look like they'll get bad before they get better. But we're called to be a light no matter how good or how bad they are. Is 2021 going to be worse than 2020? I don't know. But I'd probably tend to say yes. Or is, you, is your light going to shine no matter what? Or are you going to complain and mumble and groan? You're God's children. What happened to the ones in the wilderness when they cl- co- complained and moaned? The ones that did, did not see the promised land. Their children did, praise the Lord, because He's faithful and, and just, merciful. But those that grumbled and complained didn't. In fact, avenging angel came down and snakes came up and everything else that you can look back from scriptures. That's why we need to read the Old Testament. And it's not because that God is a different God. It's because that God is a just and holy God and demands that of His people. But yet He is loving and compassionate. And that perfect seasoning became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. And His name is Jesus. And His name is Lord. And His name is Savior. Is He your first love? consider how far you have fallen if you have other loves in your life. Repent and go back to that first love. So let's look at the second letter to the churches. The letter is to the church in Smyrna, verse 8 of chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came back to life again. Jesus reassures them of that again. I know your afflictions and your poverty. Don't worry about that, though, because you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews, that they are Christians, if we want to put that in there, and they are not. But instead are of the synagogue of Satan, because Jesus said clearly you are with him or you are against him. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't have two masters. You will love one and despise the other. So how are your affections for Jesus? Is He your first love? Verse 10, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. It's not getting much better here, is it? I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful until the point of death, and I will give you life as a victor's crown. So this church is doing good. This church obviously is loving Jesus because they're willing to suffer for Jesus. Suffering, Jesus said, for us to expect. Because if He suffered, why in the world would we expect not to suffer? No greater love does a man have than to give up his life for his friends. So they're suffering, and what does Jesus say? It's going to last longer. Sounds like the rest of Revelation that we read. But stand firm and overcome. Don't have fear of the world. Fix your eyes on my love, God's love, His power living in you. Nothing will separate you from my love. Stay firm so that you'll overcome. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Christians are called to suffer. Don't go, whoa, why why has this happened to me, Lord? Say, what am I supposed to do with this, Lord? How can I be a testimony to you? How can I be your witness? Which I told you before, actually our word martyr comes from. I will give you power and you will be my martyrs then if you want to put that word in there. Because you're willing to die for me because you realize the love that I've given to you so that you love God with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul and love others as yourself. If you do that, you will be not only rich in this world, because he tells them they're rich now, but you will be eternally rich. You're rich now because you have life in this world, but you will be eternally rich forever because you're building up your treasures in heaven. you realize that verse says that? It doesn't tell you you're building up treasures for God in heaven. It says build your treasures in heaven. And you can take that however you want to again. But Jesus tells you to build your treasures treasures in heaven. Don't fix it on this world. Build them for all eternity. 
And this letter is written to churches corporately as well as it is to individuals. So we've got to examine it as a church and say, yeah, there might be some individuals living this way that are willing to suffer and everything, but is this church as a whole willing to suffer and die for Jesus and the love that he gave to them? Are we? We should be one mind, one purpose, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, one God the Father, and one Holy Spirit tying us together, equipping us, giving us gifts. Our fruits of the Spirit should be evident as a body of Jesus Christ, being His hands and feet to this world. That, that I quoted from Matthew 6 reads this way, verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's what the pagans do. That's what you used to do. You accumulated things. Even to the point, you see that bumper sticker where it says, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? <laughs> but you're still dead, right? And if you die without eternal life, what did it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Do you realize that comes right after these verses, if you don't realize that? That if you're not willing to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Jesus, then as you read on, it says, what would it profit a man if he gained the entire world but lost his own soul? The way to gain your own soul is to follow after Jesus. It means you have to leave the world behind, take up that instrument of suffering, a cross, and follow after Jesus. So we've got this first church that didn't love Jesus as much as they used to. This second church that suffers and even takes up their cross and says, keep on doing it. And if you do, you'll have a victor's crown. So let's move on to the next church. The third and fourth churches are kind of similar. They basically tell us again that we cannot have a divided love. We can't have two loves. I won't ask you guys to ask your wives this, but you, if, if you were going to ask them if you could have a girlfriend, you definitely know the answer to that. Don't you dare. Just say it. You can't have divided loves. You can't do it. In Matthew 6, also, verse 22 to 24, it says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. You can't divide your loves. If Jesus, the light of the world, gives you the light of the world, if you have that love, you can't have any darkness. You can't look at other loves. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So with that love comes service also. That I do, because I do love my wife, then I'm willing to take out the garbage and wash the dishes, don't start again. And whatever things they are. I see you laughing too, Barry. <laughs> I do it out of love, not just because I have to, but I do it because I want to. Because I want to take some of those pressures off her. That I want to make her feel special. I want her to know that she is the love of my life. And I do need to be reminded that I do need to go back and romance and everything else so that I don't fall into a complacent love. And she reminds me, don't worry. But that doesn't mean that I still do what I should do. Anyway... <clears throat> You can't have two loves. And if you apply this to the church, and the church is the lampstand, we're the lights and the church is the lampstand, we've already seen that, then how is this love? With each other. Jesus is clear, John's clear in his writings, that you, and so is James. You can't love God if you don't love your brother. And if you're not loving your brothers and sisters, how are you going to love the world? You've seen those families where they fuss and fight all the time and everything, and you think, wow, what a messed up family. But does that reply to any of us? And if it does, then go address it, plain and simple. If you have any grievances with anybody, anything else, first of all, take yourself to the foot of the, of the throne of Jesus. Take the mote out of your own eye before you can address the speck in someone else's eye. But also realize that this love is because God loved you. 
While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. You do not deserve His love or grace, neither does anyone else, but He freely gives it, and we are His body of believers. Children of the kingdom of heaven, to live there eternally and to live like we belong to that kingdom now. Fifth letter to the churches. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive. So looking around, he said, Oh yeah, that's, that's a good church. He's a good Christian. He's got a reputation for that. But Jesus says, I know your heart. I don't just see what's on the outside. The deeds show one thing. I know your deeds. I know what they are whether the world knows them or not, because I know your motives behind your deeds. Do you check off that list and take out the garbage and wash the dishes just because you have to? Or do you do it because I want to help my wife? Because I treasure her, her? What is the motive behind what I do? <clears throat> I know you have a reputation of being alive, but, complete opposite, you are dead. You're going to church. Everything looks good. You got your affairs in proper order on the outside, but inside you're dirty and filthy and nasty. That's what the Pharisees were, weren't they? And instead of being a light to this world, they were, not, were leading themselves straight into hell, Jesus said, and leading others along with them. Oh, it's one thing that I live my life that I go to hell, but the fact that I lead others there, I, I can't even fathom. And especially that God loved me so much that He gave Jesus to die for me. So are we the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? Are we His body? Or are we just in name a church going through the motions? Here's what Jesus says to that church. Wake up! Sorry. Let's see it right here in verse 2. Wake up! I like it there, though. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished. You're going through the motions, but that doesn't mean anything. I want your heart. If you do them out of your heart, then even if I forget to do the dishes but take out the garbage, she'll realize that I love her, and she'll set me straight, go do the dishes too, but she'll realize that I did the garbage out of love. I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Remember that first love. When I died for you, gave you eternal life, you did nothing. You were an enemy of God, but I died for you. I came to you. You received my love. Now do something with it. What are we supposed to do? I'll remind you, first command, come and follow after Jesus, and He would make us disciples, fishers of men. Last command, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses even to the point of dying for that, of being a martyr because nothing else will matter to you but your love back in return. But if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief. And we have those warnings in Scripture. A thief comes to rob and steal and kill, to destroy. Jesus is clear about that. Jesus doesn't want to come to you as a thief. He wants you to be longingly looking for Him so that you're anticipating Him, expecting Him as a triumphant King, just as they were when Jesus first rode into Jerusalem, but He came to lay down His life. He will return triumphantly, and we need to recognize and be longing for that, not be unaware of it and not ready for it. <clears throat> and you will not know at what time I will come. Verse 4, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. So we went from a church who's lost its first love to a church that's willing to suffer for Christ, and he says, keep on suffering for me, to two churches with divided love, to now we've got a church with mixed individuals, some on fire for Jesus and some who aren't. So Jesus' appeal is to those who aren't, which means He's going to make His appeal through us too, that we need to make sure that our love is even stronger, that all of us are united with one mind, one purpose, one Lord, one Savior, Jesus Christ. And He reminds again, those who are victorious 
will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and His angels. Sixth letter to the church, churches, to the church in Philadelphia. You may know that Philadelphia means a city of brotherly love. Boy, that's a coincidence, isn't it? Now we've got a church that's living like it's supposed to live. The great command is what? Jesus summed it all up, remember? All the Old Testament, all the prophets, all of them hang on this one command. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't take it out, it's the, the love your neighbor, because it's tied there with the and. Because God loves you, you love others, plain and simple. So this is a church that is doing this. And if you go to modern day Turkey today, do you know that you'll still find good remnants of that church? You won't find so many of the other churches. You will a little bit of Sardis again, but Philadelphia you see a lot of the church. And from our historical records, it lasted the longest. Huh, go figure. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. So what was David? David was an insignificant young son, not as good-looking, not as strong as his brothers, but he's the one that God used because David was a man after his own heart. He had the opportunity to kill King Saul and could have justified it in his own mind because he knew that the Lord had anointed him, but he wouldn't do that because he would not take out the Lord's anointed in Saul. He would let God do it rather than him trying to take it into his own hands. He loved Jonathan like a brother. Did he make mistakes? Oh, yeah, he made mistakes. But he was a man after God's own heart, and when he made mistakes, he repented and said, I realize that I have sinned against you, O God. And God lifted him back up. He was the shepherd king that was promised from his lineage that Jesus would come, our true shepherd. So Jesus says here, He is the one who holds the keys of David, this kingdom that God has promised. And what He opens, no one can shut, and what He shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Now, I don't know what you think about verses 7 and 8 here, what Jesus is saying, but I'm going to tell you what I think. This open door for you is the gospel presentation, period. It's not so that you can live a life that brings you peace and joy, that you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength, whatever it is. It's so that you can lay down your life and suffer and die, even if that's what it takes. That you can go sell everything and give it to the poor to follow after Jesus. It's saying that if you will follow after me, I will make you fishers of men. I will open the door for you. Your children and your grandchildren as a whole will become saved and spend an eternity in heaven. You will, and maybe where you don't see it on this, in this earth, it might be to, to you get to heaven, you will see people in the kingdom of heaven because you live like Jesus in this world. That's the open door that he's put in front of you. And it's here found in the city of brotherly love. Then he says, verse 8, I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. That's why I have opened this door for you. I know that you love the Lord your God with everything and that you love your neighbor as yourself. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word, all of those promises, all of those commands, and you have not denied my name. You have been a witness. He ties both the great command and the great commission here together in this verse. You don't have a big church. You don't have big programs. You don't have skilled laborers. You have the love of Jesus in your heart, and the world knows it. And I've opened the door to bring others into the kingdom through you. Wow! What a beautiful letter to a church. What an inspiration to this church, because we're not big. We don't have all these programs. We don't have a huge budget. But we do have some loving individuals. And if we get that love out there and practice it in this world, just think of the eternal consequences that it will have. Also think of the eternal consequences if you don't follow after Jesus and fish for men because you're too focused on another love or too scared to do it. 
Verse 9, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews who are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Now we've seen these who claim to be already, and now we see them again, that they will even bow down. Why will they bow down? Because you will be eternally with Jesus, and they will not. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Does it make a lot more sense to lovingly confess Him now? Verse 10, Since you have kept my commandments to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, whatever that trial is, we won't go there, you'll be kept from it. A lot of church doctrine on this, but whatever it is, We'll agree to disagree. It doesn't matter. You'll be kept from it because you patiently endured. You kept my commands. You loved the Lord your God and you loved others. And as a result, I put an open door where others would come into the kingdom with you and you won't have to face this trial. Verse 11, I am coming soon. You know the outcome. You know the end of Revelation. Jesus will come. He will take you to be His own if you are truly His own. And there is urgency in the meantime because He's coming soon. Oh, I know, that's fine. I've got to finish this college degree. I've got to get this job set up and everything. I'll serve the Lord later. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you don't worry about the other things. You worry about where God is calling you to serve, who He's calling you to go to what He's calling you to do. Don't wait. Don't even hesitate. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. A lot of P.S. is here about Jesus loving you. And a lot of thoughts about how much you're loving Jesus, right? Okay, so now we've got the seventh letter. The letter where you say you love Jesus, but He's not your everything. You do things okay, but you're not really hot or cold. You're just lukewarm. And there's no place in the kingdom of heaven for lukewarm Christians. Verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen. No coincidence to hear again. Amen means verily, verily, or truly, truly. Listen up. We agree with you. We agree with all these other letters, and we should agree with this also. Because here's probably the biggest one that most Christians and churches fall into. Complacency and lukewarmness. They're living but they're not really living. I told you the verse, first verse that we took out of the pack was John 10, 10. I have come to give you life and life abundantly. He's also the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So he should be ruling you because you are a created being. Verse 15, I know your deeds. There's no mention of them. That you are neither cold nor hot. But I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, says it again, neither hot nor cold, here's the consequence. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now whether it's when you take a drink and you expect it to be cold and it it wasn't, you spit it out, or if it's literally to the point, don't get me wrong here, that he makes you so sick, it makes you so sick that you want to vomit. Whatever it is, God says those Christians, that type of church, God will expel out of His mouth. There is no place for them in the kingdom of heaven. Don't miss how all these letters go up to this. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. And you're either gathering or you're scattering souls for all eternity based on how you're living your life. You say, I am rich. It's what you think in your mind because you hold on to the fact that you are saved. Life is going pretty good for you, whatever it is. 
I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. I have my eternal security. But let me remind you what James wrote. First letter to the first Christians. In James 2 verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? So then John gives, I mean James gives an example, so you realize that's a rhetorical question. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you tells him, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but does not provide for his physical needs, then what good is that? So too, faith by itself, if it does not result in actions, is dead. You say that you are rich. You say that you don't need a thing, but Jesus says differently. You say that I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are instead, in Jesus' eyes, eternally wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Because you don't realize the love that God has given to you, and you're not sharing that love fervently with others. What do you need to do? Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire for true riches so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. <coughs> Jesus addresses all the things that you need attention to so that you will go and sin no more, so that you will love God, so that you will love others. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. There is urgency again. Here I am, or behold, that's how I learned it, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my verse and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus will have the kind of relationship that you shut him out of because you said, yes, I believe I want a Savior, but you never made Him Lord, and you certainly never made Him the love of your life. The world may think that you are, but Jesus knows your deeds. And if they're neither hot nor cold, He's going to spit you out of His mouth. Yeah, if they're cold, you're going to too. But if they're hot, that love affair, then you have nothing to worry about. That fear will go out of your life so that you do love and live for the kingdom because you won't worry about what others think of you, what consequences that happen to you. You will be compelled by love to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and you will fish for men. And guess what? When you fish for men, you're going to catch some. Oh, think of that person that you would not want to not spend eternity with you and fish for them passionately. Don't give up. Pray for them. Love them so that you do see them in heaven. Verse 21, To the one who is victorious I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on His throne. You read in Revelation that those that overcome that trial that comes upon them and everything, they overcome it by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony because they're not afraid to tell others about Jesus Christ. How is your love affair with Jesus? First command, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Last command, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. And the P.S. is from these letters, I love you. P.S. I love you. Those words are coming from Jesus. So you've got to answer how much you love Him in the letter you write back with your life. And don't make it an afterthought. Write it passionately from the beginning to the end. Because if you wait, who knows how much of that P.S. you'll even get to write. God loves you so much that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but instead have eternal life. Father in heaven, we do thank you for Jesus. We do thank you that he became flesh and blood, that he gave up heaven, that he lived a life without sin, that he set the example for us, that he didn't just give us commands that are worrisome or hard to follow, but he gave us commands that give us life and give us abundant life. That he could take a wretched, 
pitiful, poor, naked, and blind person like myself and transform them into a child of God. What a beautiful, wonderful masterpiece that you are creating. All by faith in Jesus Christ. Not blind faith, but total assurance that I am His child, that we are His children, that together we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Lord, equip this church so that we aren't lukewarm. Lord, draw each and every one of the mem these members to you. Let them know how much you love them and let their love be shown to this world so that we can make an impact for the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.